All right, well, let's dig into this. Um, I did a pre-recording because I just want to try and get everything edited into that 45-minute window of time that I have with you all. There's a lot to cover, um, and there are some certain things that I want to focus on. So let's go ahead and get started right away. Uh, what we're going to create is I will go ahead and give you an example here. I've got a localhost machine running. And you can see here this is uh, on my localhost, and it is showing you a fundraising screen that is pulling data from ClickBid and from Razor's Edge. So we've picked a campaign in Razor's Edge, we've started to pull the data through the um, a Sky API, and then we're also pulling data from ClickBid's um, API, and we're putting that onto the screen. But not just putting it onto the screen, we're doing it in a way that's animated so that as people walk by at a venue, uh, they're gonna see this and it's gonna be something that's happening over time. We want to get some movement. So let's kind of set the stage for how this would be used. Um, you know, at ClickBid, we specialize in fundraising events, and that means, you know, there's a ballroom or a conference center, there's big projected screens, um, there's TVs in kind of lobbies or waiting areas, and they're set to just continuously loop data, whether it's um, who's currently winning an item. Um, how much money's been raised, you know, who's checked in, any, any kind of data that you can pull out of your database is being put onto a screen. And the, unlike a website, when you load a website, the developers of the website know that it's going to be um, viewed at frame one and you can set up maybe an animation that happens for 30 seconds and everybody will get that same 30 seconds. At a venue, people walk by that screen or engage that screen throughout the entire night. So we don't know when somebody's gonna look at that screen or engage with it. So we can't have an animation that people have to watch at the very beginning um, because they're gonna miss it. And then if you needed that piece of information at the very beginning, then this, this screen really doesn't have a whole lot of relevance for you. So um, what this is trying to do is just create some ambiance, some, some activity. We're showing things happening. And as people walk by, they can see dollars coming in. They can see donations. And then they can grab that QR code, take a scan, give that money, give some money. And they can see the totals go up. They can see their dollar float by. And they can feel like they've interacted. So let's talk about how this is built. Um, I have three files in the uh, project. I have a uh, HTML page that has very basic um, you know, div structure with a container, and then I have a stage, notices, and overlays. The stage is going to be used for the background. We're going to animate the background, so it's, again, something that's moving, creating some attraction. When people walk by, they'll glance at it instead of just being a static screen. Notices is going to be used for those hearts that fly up. And the overlays are what we put the grand total and the QR code in. You kind of see them floating a little bit. I think the worst thing you can do in a, um, an event display is have something that doesn't move for a period of time. If it looks static, then it looks like maybe it crashed or something's wrong. Or worse, there's just crickets chirping and nothing's actually happening at the event. It kind of brings people's mood down. So you want to always have some movement. Show some things happening. And so we're going to animate all of these, and we're going to use a tool called GSAP, and I'll get into that uh, as we go. Uh, from this file, I'm linking to a main JS, and this is where we're going to spend most of our time in these functions that um, kind of leverage the, the animation protocol, the API, and so on. And then we also have a style sheet that will show us um, the, uh, uh, you know, give, give a, it'll actually give us the, um, style of everything instead of just you know being a bunch of text on the screen or things on the screen we're giving it some you know look and feel but style sheets is not something we'll spend a lot of time on uh, just because it's really basic boilerplate stuff all right so let's get into the main js file so the first thing i want to call attention to i'm going to condense some of these functions and um, is the you know i have a handful of functions that i've written and then i have an onload here at the bottom that triggers all of these things to kick off at the very beginning and we obviously want these that once they kick off we want them to maintain themselves to be perpetual so we'll talk a little bit about how that happens and then we also at the very top i do load up um, i import gsap and a couple of kind of animation helpers um, for easing and then i do import the style sheet uh, the last thing before we dive into some of the code is i do use a um, 
an .env file to load my variables. This is not something I recommend when using a production environment, unless you can guarantee that this is the only time it'll ever get used um, and, you're, and you don't need to recycle tokens and things like that. Normally, you would want to, when you make these two calls out to the database, uh, to you know, API, Razor's Edge, uh, Sky API, or ClickBid, you would actually instead want to call a wrapper on the server and then let that wrapper do the work of figuring out what tokens to use, if they need to be refreshed, and so on. That can be either you know, Python, .NET, um, it could be a Perl script, PHP, whatever you want. It could be um, you know, handling that on the server side, get all the data and then send it back to this page without ever exposing any tokens or keys. The other thing that it does is it allows you to keep that data on a server so that um, you know, if somebody else is building an application that uses the same access token that needs to be refreshed from time to time, then everybody gets the benefit of seeing that token refreshed and using the latest, uh, the latest versions. But in this uh, example, and what you'll find on GitHub, is I do load them up through the um, .env file. And I'm using just a standard Vite um, uh, you know, uh, packaging tool or packing tool, uh, and then it lets me run kind of a localized web server. So I can pull those in. We can, you know, we have a couple other utility um, variables that I'll show you a little bit about, and then I have a formatting function that formats my numbers into currency. So the first thing we want to do is we obviously want to get the data from ClickBit and Razor's Edge. Now, um, using JavaScript, I'm going to use a very standard, highlight this, a very standard fetch. Um, fetch call and I'm calling the gift v1 gifts date added uh, with parameter with a timestamp. So I want to make sure that when I call, let's go back to our, uh, we're going to do a little drawing here. Um, let's say I'm, you know, right now we are right at this time frame. So this is, you know, this is time x, this is time x plus, uh, you know, uh, you know, 100 seconds, whatever. And we are, uh, we are, you know, right here in the middle. So we're going to, we load the page. We want to go back in time and get all of the donations that have come in during this period of time. So we're going to fetch an array of all the donations that came in during this period. So in this example with Razor's Edge, I'm going back to the 5th of uh, May, 2023, because I'm using a development environment. Uh, there are a lot of donation or a lot of gifts that have come in um, to uh, the demo, the t development environment. So I, you know, I'm already getting several hundred. I think it's like 800 donations. So it's already a big array. With ClickBit, I'm actually just going to go back to the beginning of time. ClickBit uses a Unix timestamp, so a one is going to be, you know, 1971. Um, and then when I get the API call back. So I'd make my API call, um, Razor's Edge NXT, you know, requires an, a subscription key and a bearer token, which is the access token you get from um, OAuth. Uh, we're not gonna go into, in this tutorial, we're not gonna go into you know, authorization and um, authenticating with Razor's Edge or ClickBid just because of time. Um, there are a lot of great tutorials on Razor's Edge's website and their documentation. You could even get some helper libraries that can do this for you, but, we're calling that out. We're going to, if we don't get a, uh, any kind of error, which would tell us that maybe our access token was expired, then we're going to process the data. I always use a console just to kind of look at my data so I can see what I'm getting back from the API. It helps me a lot. So I just spit that out in the console. Then I'm going to update my reference date to whatever time I called this first call. So if I go back to my timeline here, my reference date is going to get updated to, you know, this is X plus, you know, let's say it's X plus 50. Wow, my writing is bad. So now I'm just doing an X plus 50. So the next time I call out to the Razor's Edge API, I'm only going to get data from within this window right here. And then I'm going to update my reference again. And then the next time the API calls, it's only going to get data from this window of time. And then the next time it calls and so on. So this is how I can keep the data current because I'm not actually calling all the data all the time and then parsing through it. I'm actually using kind of a pin to say, okay, only get me data from this period of time. Um, and uh, the same is true with ClickBit. Once I call the ClickBit API, if I 
close this and expand this. I'm calling the fetch, uh, again, the CB root API path and then bids. You can get the paths inside of the um, Git repository. I do provide that in the sample file. And then we do ask for a timestamp to say, hey, how far back do you want us to go for these um, bids or donations? And you can go ahead and provide that. Every time the, the API responds, it gives us a new timestamp, basically equal to the time that this thing executed. So if I want to call it 10 minutes from now or two seconds from now, I can say only get me data since the last time it was called. I don't know why I spend so much time on that. It's uh, it's an interesting concept. I've always, you know, I really enjoy using it, um, you know, whenever I can to, to limit the amount of data I get back. I guess maybe working with other APIs that don't allow that has been a little bit challenging. So I do like to, you know, get that data over time because again, if we go back to our display here, we're pulling data and looping through it and displaying it. I don't want to have to do all of it all over again. I want to just do it once. And, and then the next time this API calls, I only want to get any data that's changed. During a fund to need and an, an event, people are putting their paddles in the air. So we're going to get the most recent batch of donations. And then while it's processing that, more are coming in. We'll get the next set and so on. Now, once I get the data from ClickBit and Razor's Edge, I'm going to call the exact same functions. I'm going to call random heart update total. We're going to talk about those in a moment. And we're going to loop through the amount of data that I get. So really, I want to call those, um, those functions uh, for every piece of data that I get back. But if I, if I didn't have this await delay function, which is essentially just don't do anything for three seconds, what I would get is if I comment that out, save it, you're going to see all of these hearts just show up at once. And then that's it. And again, if this... Every time I refresh this page, that's what they're going to do. They're just going to show up and disappear. And then from, from that on, from that time on, then I'm never going to see another heart from ClickBid because that's what I put. I didn't. I got rid of the delay. If I actually wait three seconds, I can stagger out those donations. And you can see here now they're starting to come in. Even when I refresh, they're only coming in uh, one at a time every three seconds. Well, that's that's much better because again, the screen has to live on a pedestal for two hours, three hours, four hours. It's got to show activity over time. We don't want it to just blast out all its information. One, if there's a lot of data, it could end up being just an overwhelming um, uh, processing on the computer and it'll crash the system because you have all these new elements on the screen and, and the CPU can't handle it. So it delays them in there, uh, being placed in there, and then it cycles through it. When it's done, we actually set another timeout to wait for more seconds before we actually call this function again. So once this is done, we're going to set a timeout, four seconds, and then fetch this function again. And so um, the reason I wait four seconds in addition to waiting three seconds is there are times when you'll get no data. So we don't want this to call perpetually just every few milliseconds. We want it to kind of have a little bit of breathing room. So the first time you call it, yes, you're going to get a lot of data because it's going back to the beginning of time. But after you've gathered all that data and caught up, you may go 10, 15 API calls without any data returned. Then you want to wait that four seconds to give the API just some breathing room um, and don't overwhelm the resources of the uh, receiving server. The same is true for um, Razor's Edge. We're going to give it a four second timeout at the very least. Um, now, the other thing that's happening here in this code is what we're doing the while. And because this is an async function up here, we identified this as an async function uh, and we have we can provide the await. And the await will force us to sit in this loop until it's done. Then it will process the timeout. So the nice thing is we're not going to, you know, let's say I have, in this case, I think I had 800 donations in Razor's Edge that I'm collecting at the first batch. It's going to cycle through that before it finally reaches back out to Razor's Edge. Instead of okay, while it's doing those 800, let's check again, check again, check again. You're not stacking these API calls on top of each other. You are waiting until it's done. There's other ways to do this. Um, you know, I would, uh, I like this approach, uh, especially for a screen that's going to live in a room for, you know, uh, for hours. It gives us something to look at. Again, the goal of your, of your display is to give people something to look at, to see mo movement, to see 
action. Well, if these people are giving, then I should give. Let me scan the QR code and then I'll make a donation. And this total is just really helping us get a handle on what's coming in. Is it 100% accurate? Not yet because it's still compiling it. But it's it, what we don't want to have happen is that the number is too high and we have to, people stop giving. So as people are giving on this, um, you know, it's, it's adding to the total, but then um, it'll eventually get to the actual amount that's been raised. And over time that will start to climb and you'll start to see that number increase. All right, so remember, just thing to remember on these two functions, the fetch data from Razor's Edge, fetch data from ClickBid, we're calling these two functions, random heart and update total, which I wanna get back to in a moment, because for now I wanna step over and introduce you to GSAP. So the first function we call when the page is loaded is start blur. If I scroll up here to start blur, it's a very simple um, function that will call, it's just grabbing the stage element on the, on the page. If I go back to H, the HTML, we grab this element here. And in the style sheet, you can, um, when you look at the styles, if I go to container stage, the container is 100% wide, 100% tall, and it is a position absolute. So it will take up the full width of the browser screen. And then the um, stage is also pinned to the top left, right, and bottom. So it is 100% of the width of the screen. So that's good because now we have the whole screen to work with. So I'm gonna grab that, kind of hang on to it, and then I'm gonna loop through, um, you know, do this basic for loop, and I'm gonna do an, another timeout function where I make what are called lights. And when you look at what we're, what we're doing is we're actually creating these little gray circles, faded circles that we put on the screen. So that is going to, um, you know, create those. Now, how many is count? Well, we set that up here in our, in the initialization process, we have 20. So we're gonna have, we're gonna call this function 20 times. But instead of calling it all at the same time, just cycling through it only milliseconds apart, we're actually incrementally adding a delay to when this actually calls the function. And we're using the I variable, which is great because it's going to be 500 milliseconds a delay for the first function to call and then 500 times 20 for the 20th make light function to call. So that means we're gonna call them sequentially over time, which again is great because we wanna make sure that we don't, whenever you're doing these elements that you put on screen and you animate, these are divs, spans, h2 tags, p tags that we're animating. We need to be conscious of the performance of the CPU. If we overclock the CPU or we, we consume all of the RAM, we have too many elements, or we snowball, we just keep adding elements and never exposing them or exposing of them or disposing of them, then our CPU, our computer is going to crash half an hour into the display and none of our displays are going to work. And that's going to obviously be bad. So what we're doing here is we're saying don't do an infinite number of circles, just do 20 and then call this 20 times over a period of time. So what does make light do? So make light is where we actually get into um, animating and building elements. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna make a uh, span element and we're gonna slap it into the stage. It's passing that into uh, this uh, function here. We're passing the stage in and it's gonna create and append a span to that. And then we're gonna use the GSAP um, object to attach, to make that span use GSAP properties. So I'm adding that span and then I'm going to, then I'm going to attach it. I'm going to create these, um, add these properties, the initialization properties. I'm going to set a left position, a top position, a scale, and an opacity. Now if I go to my browser and then I do, you know, if I just do GSAP and then I Check out the homepage, GreenSock. This is the library uh, uh, that we're using today. It's the GreenSock animation platform. I'm not really sure. But what we want to look at are the docs. And so when I make a GSAP element, I'm going to go to the set function. And so we come down here to set, and this is, they really do have great documentation. So the first property in the set function is what it is you're trying to set. It's the element, the DOM element, in the, in the page. The second is a, an array of parameters. So when I do a set, I can 
give it the element in the DOM that I want to control, and then I can have an array of properties. In my case, my properties are left, top, scale, and opacity. So I want the left position of this circle to be somewhere between zero and the width of the screen, and I want the top to be somewhere between zero and the height of the screen. So I just want it to be a random number. And GSAP has some utilities that are really, really helpful. We use the random one quite a bit when we want to create different positions for things. Um, and this is great when you're having when you're having data being pulled into an API and you want to have something happen to it. You don't want it to be so formulaic that it's the same every time. Maybe a position or uh, maybe it's different levels of blurriness or so on. You can set those uh, and you can animate them. So the next thing we want to do is we want to create a timeline. And to describe timelines, what I want to get into is my board here. So let's talk about GSAP uh, because this is the, the gist of our uh, presentation. How does GSAP work? It's an animation tool that allows you to build complex movements over time and animate things like opacity, scale, position, and so on. So in a traditional environment, you would have to use like a set interval or a set timeout and you'd have to, you know, every time it ran, you'd have to take the current X position, add two pixels to it, and then move the element. And obviously that would take an enormous amount of time. But with GSAP, the, the incremental movements are handled through parameters instead of actually writing logic on every iteration. The way to make this work really smoothly is to create a timeline. And so in GSAP, I'm going to set a you know, timeline and then I'm going to draw a line in between it. And let's just set a some text here and I'm just going to say, you know, time zero and I'm going to say time 10. And let's actually make this a little bit bigger so you can see it. Okay, so from time zero to time 10, we want something to happen. Well, what is it that we want to have happen? What I'd like is, let's do some, again, some more drawings. Let's make a uh, box. All right, so I'd like that box to move from here to here in 10 seconds. So how is that going to work in GSAP? What I'm going to do is I'm going to initialize the box using style sheets and tell it where I want it to go. So I'm going to say this, let's just call this span, um, let's just call it box. And we're going to make this text bigger again. And I'm going to move. So this is box. What I want to do is tell GSAP that this box is part of my animation and I'm going to set an initial position. So let's take a look at our code. That's exactly what I'm doing here. I'm saying create a new span and attach it to GSAP as something that can be animated and let's set its initial position. And we're going to make it random somewhere on the stage. So somewhere on my screen, I'm going to start this circle and I want it to be uh, a scale somewhere between 80% and 120% of its original size. And my variant is 0.1. So the possible parameters here are going to be 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 1, 1.1, 1 1.2. .1, this is a precision value. And then I don't want anybody to be able to see it. So that's the starting point. So we go back to our you know, box. The starting point is, is we're setting that up in GSAP. So we're saying put it there and make it these things, invisible, scaled, whatever. Now, I want to animate it. Basically, I want to animate this box to this position in 10 seconds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call the to function, and I'm going to say, okay, at its basic level, the to function says move the element that you've assigned, which is box, move it to this position. Now, when you, when you animate something, you're telling, you're, you're, instead of saying a coordinate of where I want it to go, you're basically saying how many pixels you want to push it. So in this case, maybe I want to move it 500 pixels to the right. That's it. That's all I care about. I just want it to, from time zero to time 10, I just want it to push uh, to the right 500 pixels. 
All right, well, that's basic animation. What if I want the box? Remember, the box is invisible. So I want the box, I need to do more complex things. I need to fade the box in as it's moving and I need to fade the box out as it's getting close to the end. So what I want to do is I go back to my um, drawing here and let's see if I can get that red back or whatever. I want it to fade in and then I want it to fade out. So that way it's nice and smooth. So when it's, when it's starting its movement to the end, it's fading in for this amount of time, and then once we get closer to the end, we're fading out. So what is this really? This is this is um, you know we got one movement, we've got two movement, and we've got three movement. So we want to stack all these together in what's called a timeline. So we're going to give this. We're actually going to call it. Let's move this up here and make it bigger again. This is our timeline. And then we're gonna execute that timeline. So in GSAP, we're building a timeline. We add elements to something, and then we execute it. So the first thing we wanna add is the fade in. And I should, have, I should have moved this. Let's do one, two, and three. So the first thing I wanna do is fade it in. The second thing I wanna do is move it. And the third thing I wanna do is fade it out. So I also want them to happen overlapping each other. So let's take a look at the code. If I create a timeline, so I'm basically establishing a timeline and I want it to not do anything until I tell it to, so I want it to be paused. Then when it's complete as my second parameter, I want it to remove itself. This is so that I don't have a bunch of invisible circles that are just sitting on the screen taking up space and resources and then eventually my browser crashes. So when it's done, I wanna remove that span and then I want to remake it. So remember, I passed in a number between 1 and 20. When this thing is done, I want it to respawn itself and go through the same process over again. So now I've established the timeline, and I want to create my three elements. So I basically just call the, the two function three times, and I attach it to my timeline. So I'm going to do TL, which is what I created the timeline as, and I want to create a two. I want to make sure that I'm using this span because I could be animating more than one thing. Let's just let's say I'm not just animating a box. I'm animating a box and you know a balloon. But in this case, it's just a, a box. Well, actually, it's a circle. So I'm taking this circle and I want it to go to. Remember, we're saying where is it now and where is it going to? So right now it's invisible. And when I want it, when it's done, I want it to be somewhere between 50% and 80% opaque. And I want it to happen over a third of a second. In GSAP, they use seconds, not milliseconds. So one is one second, 0.3 is a third of a second. So this is all I want. This is the first movement that I want to have happen. I want it to change its opacity over three seconds. So fade it in. Then I want to move it. And this is that movement, and I want it to move randomly, again, using that GSAP utilities function. I'm calling the to function, I'm passing it the same span I've been using, and I want it to move 40 pixels left or right, so somewhere between 40 pixels left and right, somewhere between 40 pixels up and down, and then I want that to happen um, for a random time between five and seven seconds with a precision of 0.2. So my available options will be 5, 5.2, 5.4, 5.6, and so on, up to seven. I also have this easing parameter. I can make it do um, speed up and slow down. This is what makes this tool so incredibly powerful. I can't even imagine how you would write code to build this in just pure vanilla JavaScript. Thankfully, the people at GSAP have already done that, and all we have to do is pass a parameter. So this power zero allows us to um, pass a type of easing. If I go to the documentation and I go back to the docs and I do eases, you have a little generator here that shows you what some of these look like. So if I just do power three, you can see the ball moves, starts out fast, and then it moves slow, and then it, or we can do bounce, so fast, bounce, bounce, bounce. So you have a lot of different options, and you can see these are the way, um, that these are the parameters that you can use to make that happen. This is more of a rough, you can do a slow, it starts out slow, and this 
or starts out fast, goes slow, and then uh, gets fast again. And then steps, you know, it can move in just really quick movements and so on. All right, so in this case, I don't want any easing. These circles just show up, they move, and then they fade out. We're gonna come back to this parameter in just a second. We're gonna talk about the last movement. The last movement is a fade out. We want it to go, again, to. This is, a, this is where it's going to. From the last element that was called, what is it going to do? So from the, in the previous to function that we added to the timeline, we want this to fade out over a third of a second. That's it. All I want it to do is whatever transparency it's at now, I want it to be zero in, in a third of a second. So, and it takes the value of the previous timeline item. So remember, we started out transparent, we faded it in. So now it's somewhere between 50 and 80%. Well, when we get to this timeline item, it's gonna make it zero. So it's gonna fade it out. All right, so if I go back to my whiteboard, what I've created without any um, other parameters is I've created a timeline and I'm gonna fade it in for 0.3 seconds. I'm gonna animate it up or down 40 pixels one way or the other for five to seven seconds and then I'm gonna fade it out for 0.3 seconds. This is very linear. This is a linear timeline, meaning it's going to do the first thing, then the second thing, then the third thing. Well, we want it to overlap. We don't, anything in life has overlapping action. When you throw a football, you're moving your arm back, you're rotating your body, you're moving your hand, and then when you throw, you're moving your arm, your hips, your legs, your torso, and then you're releasing with your hand and letting the football go. These things don't happen in linear fashion, so we need them to overlap like we have in this timeline. I want it to fade in while it's moving. I want it to fade out while it's moving. So the nice thing about GSAP timelines is we have the ability to tell the second element to position itself based on the first element. So if I go back to my timeline here and I look at, again, I have my two, my so this is my first one. My second one has this final parameter after the properties that tells it where I want it to go. So I want it to move, I want the second element to move backwards a third of a second from the end of this one. So if this element is, is, is a third of a second long, if I do nothing, this will start at a third of a second. But I want it to start at less than a third of a second because I want them to overlap. The last element, I want it to, to be a third of a second before the last element ends, but instead of putting um, you know, 0 0.03, this would say, okay, well, do this a third of a second before it starts. We don't want it to do that. We want it to be at the, we want, it, we want the last uh, opacity change to be at the end of the timeline. So we want this to, say, all right, it's a weird string value, and it's saying push push this element to the end of the previous element, and then back it up a third of a second. So if we look at our timeline, we're taking the third element, sending it to the very right of the second element, the one before it, and then backing up a third of a second. So now I have this kind of sandwiched timeline. This is called nonlinear timelines, because these things are not happening one after another, they're overlapping. And so we have a fade in while it's moving and a fade out while it's moving. So let's go back to our display here. And now look, we have these, these circles fading in, moving, and then fading out. And then as, when they complete, they are destroyed and we start over with a brand new one. So this one fades out and it may repopulate over here somewhere. So that's a real, so right, you know, again, just to summarize that, you have, first you attach the element in the DOM to GSAP, give it some initialization properties. Then you create a timeline. And then third, you create as many timeline elements as you would like. So I can change, and it's not just movement that you change in your timeline. You can change opacity, scale. You can make them all separate movements. Just like when I throw the football, I, can, I want to animate my arm, hips, legs, face, hand, elbow, whatever. I want all those things to animate differently. You're overlapping those movements, and GSAP lets you get very, very granular.
So then once you've got that timeline, I'm going to go ahead and play it. Remember, it was paused at start, so I'm just going to go ahead and play it. So that is what's happening 20 times in a row before the um, before anything else happens. So we want to build that, again, that background. These are There's 20 of these. If you counted them out, there's 20 of them on screen at any time. And it's going to be permanent. This is going to happen. It's an animated background. It's really, really nice. Now, the other thing that we're doing is we are, let's skip these two API calls. We're doing floats. And I want to float the QR code and the total. What does that look like? You can see my QR code and my total are kind of moving around. Again, that creates some movement. It shows the people that are walking by that this display hasn't frozen that there's movement happening. It gets people's attention and we want them to, to pay attention because this is something you should scan. In fact, you could even, you could bounce this, you could rotate it a little bit more, you could spin it once in a while. Again, it's really just to get people's attention and to keep the movement going, let people know that it hasn't stopped running and so on. So the float animation is a much more in-depth timeline. So, but it's essentially the same thing. I'm creating a new timeline and then I'm taking the div that I passed into it, which is my QR div and my total div, and I'm passing, like it looks like a, maybe a 10 step animation. And really all it is, again, is the, the element that I wanna animate, how long do I wanna animate it, and what are my parameters. In this case, I am using easing, so I wanna ease in and out, meaning easing in and out is speeds up, slows down like a football. I, when I throw a football, it starts out slow and then it slows back down when it gets to the end. And that, they're all going to use easing. They're all going to have a different type of parameter. In this case, I'm changing just the Y parameter. In other cases, I'm changing the Y, the X, and the rotation. And then it gives me a little bit of animation that gives me that kind of movement. And then really, I have this one parameter here. Remember in the in the start blur or the make light, we had a paused true in our timeline. Down here, we don't have a paused in our timeline, but we have this repeat negative one. I have a negative one and that tells GSAP to just do this indefinitely. Once you start, just don't stop. Just keep repeating. And you can again, get these parameters inside of the GSAP documentation. If I go back to my documentation, I can go to, again, back to docs, GSAP, and then there is a two down here. And I can see, again, these parameters. And I can play around, it has a nice little kind of, kind of sandbox here. And then you can come down here to your parameters and you can then see what's available to you. So some of the things that you can animate. The last animation that I'm doing is a random heart. So let's close this and go back to the fetch data. Remember, I'm, I'm calling two functions, random heart, update total. Update total is very basic. We're, we're just basically updating the uh, DOM elements text to you know whatever amount has been raised. And so the one that really has value in this tutorial is the random heart. So what are we doing? Every time I call a random heart, I'm passing a dollar amount. So the amount is going to be um, turned into a, an integer in case it comes in. Depending on the API, it may come in as a string or a number. So we're just going to make sure it's a number. Then we're going to create a new span element. We're going to capture the notices element inside of the DOM. So we have uh, notices. And so we're going to make sure that we put whatever we build here, we're going to put it in that. So if I go back to, okay, yep. So then we have notices. And then I'm going to add a heart class to my new span that I just created. And then the inner HTML, the HTML that I create, I'm gonna use a string literal here to pass in the dollar amount, and I'm gonna add my heart SVG, which is part of the um, part of my packaging here. And then I'm going to append it. So I'm gonna build my div on the fly and attach it to my, to my notices uh, element. Now, I'm going to set two random values. I want to tell this heart where to start and where to stop. I want it to start on the X, so it's going to be, again, using the random utility, somewhere between zero and the width of the screen. So it's going to put it somewhere along that path. And then where, where do I want it to end? I want it to end 
either 200 pixels to the left or 200 pixels to the right. Remember, we're going to use a to function, and the to function says move this element from where it is, how many pixels one direction or up or down. We don't, we're not moving it to a coordinate, we're moving it a distance. So we're just kind of establishing those variables, and then we're going to create, we're going to use the set function again. So the set function initializes our span and puts it somewhere. In this case, we're putting it to the left, we're setting the left element somewhere along the, the base of the, or somewhere along the X coordinates of the screen. The bottom, I want it to be negative 100 pixels. So I want it to be off screen. So I don't want it to be on screen when it starts. And then scale, I want it to be somewhere between 80% and 120%. Or I don't want all my hearts to be the same size because then it just starts to look too, too rep duplicated. I need it to look a little more different. So we're going to change the scale, randomize it. And then I need it to be blank. I don't need it to, I'm invisible. I don't need it to be trans, I want it to change its transparency over time. So that's my starting point. So I'm basically establishing it. Now, I'm doing the same thing I did with the faded circles. I'm going to do a timeline. So I'm creating a timeline that is paused at the start. And when it's done, I want to just remove what I created and animate it. So that way, again, I don't build up a bunch of spans over time and cause my browser to crash. I have three elements that I'm going to animate. I'm animating, again, this is the exact same thing I did with the circles. If I go back to the, oops, I had it. It was, you know, again, I want it to fade in while it's moving and fade out while it's ending its move. So we go back to the code. Our first element in the, in the timeline is a opacity. I want it to move from zero opacity to 100% over 8 tenths of a second. The next element, our next animation I want is I want it to move to that either 200 pixels left or 200 pixels right. And I want it to go the height of the window. So it's going to be, it's going to move negative because if the height of the window is, is 1,000 pixels and I'm moving this in a direction, I want it to move it up. So I want it to go negative 1,000 pixels up. And I want it to take somewhere between 6 and 8 seconds with an accuracy of 0.2. I don't want any easing. I don't want it to speed up, slow down. I just want it to move gracefully. That's it. But I don't want this thing to start after the first thing is finished. I don't need it to fade in, then start moving. I want it to start moving and fade in as it moves. So I need to take this timeline element and push it back the same duration as it's fading in. So that way when this starts fading in, it's already started moving. The last element that I want to animate is a fade out. The fade out, I don't need it to last very long, just a third of a second. I want it to fade completely out. And I want this animation element to start a third of a second before the end of the previous element. So that's what this string value is saying. Move this element to the end of the previous timeline element, but pull it in a third of a second. So that way it fades out as it's coming to the end of its movement. And when we're done, hit play. And so we're going to repeat this every time we have a random heart. The good news is I can create as many hearts as I want because I created this on complete that says dump it. So if I just, I'm going to hit a refresh here on my screen and you can see I'm starting at zero. My numbers are going up and my hearts are moving. Again, they're in random spots. You know, the width of the screen, you're going to see some, hopefully, eventually, yep, start up over here, over here, and they're moving 200 pixels left or right. And the dollar amount and the QR code are just happily kind of bouncing around, giving us some movement, and the circles are animating in the background. And this screen can live forever, and it'll continuously call the Razor's Edge and the ClickBit API to bring these up on screen.